Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, and uh, a warm welcome to all of you to this Prime Chapter Talks and this time hosted by the Prime Chapter North America by the Chapter Chair Liz Collier. And I'm very excited to welcome you all to, to the next hour here and I'm personally looking much forward to a fabulous team that the Liz Collier has uh, gathered from the North American uh, business schools who have signed up to Prime uh, to hear more about tools frameworks, resources for action on the sustainable development goals in the classroom, but beyond. My name is Mette Morsing and uh, I will, I'm the head of Prime and I will certainly be here for the next hour with you and uh, over to you, Liz, please. Thanks, Meta. Greetings everybody from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, my name is Liz Collier and I'm the chair of uh, Prime North America and a professor of business ethics at the Brennan School of Business at Dominican University in River Forest, Illinois. We're grateful to be hosting this month's Prime Chapter webinar. Our focus is on how some of our chapter's signatories and partners have maintained robust engagement opportunities in pedagogy, research, and networking in spite of COVID this year and how others in the Prime community can access these resources for themselves as they plan for the next academic year. We have four speakers today. Each of them will introduce themselves, explain their Prime and SDG engagement initiative or platform and provide resources for you. This webinar and the resources will be available via a link on the, the North America chapter page on the Secretariat's website after the recording. Thank you just for housekeeping. Thank you for keeping your, your mic off during the presentation. Uh, we should have question, uh, time for questions at the end. And if we don't, then my email address is on the Prime website and you are welcome to reach out to me and we'll get an answer to your question. Our first speaker is Megan Buchter from Aim to Flourish. Megan? Thanks, Liz. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Buchter. I am the, let's see if this works. There we go. I'm the director of the Fowler Center for Business as an Agent of World Benefit at Case Western Reserve University. Um, and I also run our Aim to Flourish program that I'm going to be talking about in just a little bit. Um, I also just wanted to start off by mentioning that the history of the Fowler Center um, is very intertwined with the history of um, the UN Global Compact and also Prime, that our Global Forum conference series that we put on was launched with the UN Global Compact. Our next Global Forum is coming up uh, in October of 2021. And it was at one of our Global Forums where Prime was designed and developed around the idea of if you want to change how business operates, you have to change the way that it's taught. And then conversely, our Aim to Flourish program was also was launched at a prime global forum in the summer of 2015. So we've been very connected with prime and the UN Global Compact um, throughout our entire history. So today I'm going to talk about more about our Aim to Flourish program. Aim to Flourish is a lot of things. Uh, it's a it's a free, flexible, professor facilitated curriculum supporting business as an agent of world benefit and the UN Global Goals. So if you're looking for ways to get the UN Global Goals into what you're teaching your students, this is a great tool. Um, it's a student assignment that allows your students to learn about the ways that businesses can and should be achieving, helping to achieve the UN Global Goals. Uh, we're a global community of business students, professors, business leaders, a worldwide resource. We have um, schools and professors that participate and use Aim to Flourish from all over the world and a celebration. So we do our annual Flourish Prizing process, which I'll talk a little bit about a little bit later. We're going through the process right now for our 2021 Flourish Prizes, um, but you can check out all of our past Flourish Prize winners on our website. Just some, some brief statistics. We have over 3,000 stories published. Um, Today, that number is as of December 31st, so as of the end of 2020, um, but we've already started publishing stories for the 
uh, for spring semester. So we're already receiving stories for, for this semester from professors that are using this tool in their classrooms. Um, as of the end of 2020, we had 113 universities and 144 professors that have published stories on our Aim to Flourish platform. Um, and our members come from over 107 countries. So this really is a very global program used all over the world. Um, and there are some other statistics there about uh, how many stories we published in 2020 and how many professors and schools, uh, the types of businesses that were published about in 2020 as well. Aim to Flourish has a very robust website, uh, www.aimtoflourish.com. So that's where you can go to find all of our resources, to find all of the information you need about our program, how it works, uh, what your students need to do, how you can incorporate it into your class. Um, and so I'm just gonna uh, walk you through the website just a little bit here. So under our innovations tab, that's where you can go and you can first go to browse stories. So you can see all of the stories that are published. The more than 3,100 stories that are published are there under browse stories. There's a very robust uh, search feature. So if you're looking for a specific professor that's used this before or a specific country or region or university to see um, you know, what other professors at your school have done, you wanna see their stories, um, you can use our search feature and, and find them that way. Um, Fun fact, all the other professors that will be presenting on this call today all have stories published on our Aim to Flourish website by their students. So go and check them out and see what kind of stories their students have been publishing. When your students are ready to write their stories, if you're using Aim to Flourish in, their, in your classes, um, I've circled the create a story and dashboard buttons, which are also under the innovation menu those would, would be the places where your students would go to be able to create their story and then also to get back to their story um, as, they, as they work on their story and send it over to you. We have a lot of resources on our website. And when I talk about Aim to Flourish, I use the word flexible a lot. So we have a whole page of professor resources that are designed to give you tools to help teach your students about business for good, about appreciative inquiry, about the UN global goals. And those resources include articles, suggested activities, PowerPoint presentations, um, but you can pick and choose through what you want to use. So Aim to Flourish, our resources really are very flexible. There's besides the actual assignment that your students go through that I will walk you through um, in just a couple minutes, everything is very flexible. How you want to incorporate it into your class is very flexible. And so we give you a lot of resources that will help you do that in whatever way is best for you. Um, we also have a student resources page. And so this page is really designed just to walk your students through the assignment of selecting, interviewing a business leader, and then writing about that, that company. So this page is designed for the students to get them through that assignment. And then you'll also see there are resources related to appreciative inquiry, to the global goals. Videos will take you to our YouTube channel. Um, publications mention all the different places where Aim to Flourish has come up in different articles or books. FAQs, if you need some help with questions, although we're also always available to answer questions for you, with you for you as well. And then I also just wanted to mention our Flourish Prize, the section of our website that talks about our Flourish Prizes. Um, we have a lot of information here. So our prizes go back to 2017. So this year, 2021, this is the fifth year that we will be going through our Flourish Prizing process, which we are going through right now. Um, we should be announcing our Flourish Prize uh, honorees in sometime in late May. Um, and the Flourish Prizes for each year are based off of stories published the previous calendar year. So by using Aim to Flourish in your course, um, you and your students are, and having a story published on the website, you and your students are automatically <laughs> entered into this process to potentially um, have a, a Flourish Prize um, when we do that process. And um, actually all of the schools represented here in this webinar have also been awarded Flourish Prizes in one or more of the past four years that we have um, 
done this prizing process. And you can look at each page and see all 17 winners. We give one flourish prize for each of the UN 17 UN Global Goals. And so you can go to this section of the website and look at all of the past winners. Um, I also want to mention that beyond doing the main Aim to Flourish assignment, which I'm going to get into next, using the Flourish prizes or going to these pages and seeing the stories that have been published are also is also really good for using these types of companies as case studies in your class. So you can, you know, if you're not ready to use the Aim to Flourish, um, the full Aim to Flourish assignment, or even if you are, but you want to point your students towards specific case studies or specific businesses that um, you want to talk about or you want them to look at, this is a great place of the website to kind of narrow down stories for you to use as case studies in your class, um, since we have more than 3,100 stories published on our website. So these are the best of the best stories that have been, that have been written about, um, written every year. And so it's a great place to go and um, just find companies that you might want to incorporate into your classes. So the Aim to Flourish assignment, the basis of the assignment is that students um, select and interview business leaders or social entre entrepreneurs about a company that is meeting one or more of the UN Global Goals. Um, then they go through a process, there's a workflow where they write the story, professor reviews their story right on the website, um, can go back to the students if any changes are needed, moves on to us, we review the story and then get it published on the website. And then, like I mentioned, every year we celebrate the best of the best stories with the annual Flourish Prizing process. Um, so the stories that are published on Aim to Flourish follow some basic criteria. Um, the company should be a for-profit company. The innovation that the student is writing about should be embedded in the business and not just philanthropy, not just something nice that the company is doing, but really part of the heart of the, the organization. The innovation should have a positive impact. So as opposed to doing less harm, um, whatever the company is doing should have a, a, a net positive impact. And then that innovation should be scalable or replicable, which doesn't mean that it has to be very big right now, just that at some point it could grow or another organization could pop up in another area doing something similar. Additionally, all of our Aim to Flourish stories are tied back to the UN Global Goals. So each one of the stories um, should be meeting one or more of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And so we have a way that the students can select up to five global goals that the company, that the innovation is meeting. And so each story that's published identifies the global goals that that innovation is or that that story is talking about. And then finally, the interview. So every single story published on Aim to Flourish on the Aim to Flourish website um, is based off of an interview. The students conduct an interview with the business leader or social entrepreneur. Um, it's really the main part of the assignment, getting students out of the classroom to talk to a business leader, to talk to somebody that's, that's doing this, that's living this, that's um, giving the students that one that example of what you've been teaching them in class, and we use an we use appreciative inquiry for the style of interview. Um, you can incorporate appreciative inquiry into your class as much or as little as you like to, um, but we provide the students with an interview guide that is an appreciative inquiry style interview guide, and so they're automatically using appreciative inquiry and asking these types of strength based questions when they go in to do their interview. So incorporating Aim to Flourish into your class can be very flexible. We have um, tons of sample syllabi on our professor resources page for you to use. This program can be used at the graduate, undergraduate, even high school level or executive education as well. It can be done individually by individual students or in groups. Um, I have faculty that do this, have their give their students anywhere from a few weeks to do the assignment to having it be a semester long project. Um, it can also be a unique assignment where it's just this, you're doing the Aim to Flourish assignment and it stands on its own, or it can be part of a bigger um, project, such as incorporated into a the impact project, um, like David Steingard does in his class, or even incorporated into um, Professor Jeff Thies is going to talk about their, um, their case competition, so it can be incorporated into some sort of larger project as well. Um, 
you can suggest businesses for your students to, um, to write about, or you can have them find them on their own. I know that finding businesses often feels very stressful to the students, but it also gives them that opportunity to really find something that they're passionate about and end up talking to somebody that, that, they, that really has an impact on them. Um, and then kind of along the same lines, you can also you know, give your students free range to find any company they want or specifically specify that they look for local companies or companies in a certain area or companies in a certain region. And then related to COVID-19, although we've been doing this since we've launched the program, um, interviews can be conducted in person or also virtually. Um, so your students can um, you know, sit down one-on-one, -on -one, go to the business, that's great, but we also understand that during this time, uh, you know, everything is happening virtually just like this webinar. So students can use Zoom, Skype, whatever kind of technology they need to do their interviews virtually. And we've always encouraged our students to do that. So this hasn't been a big change for us over the past year, just making a bigger point that this is a great way to have students do interviews and have students um, get a chance to talk to those business leaders. Finally, um, the benefits of Aim to Flourish are really en endless. So it's, it's, you know, I've said it before, it's flexible, it's really easy to fit into your class. It can fit into a variety of classes. Your students are gonna learn about leaders that do good and do well financially. Um, they're gonna create a relationship with those business leaders and be able to have a relationship with that organization, with that person that they interviewed with. They're gonna sharpen their business interview skills. So it's good for students to get out and talk to business leaders and have that experience and you know, think about whether, you know, how they're doing that online or how they're presenting themselves in person. Um, and then there's that added benefit of, of getting to be involved in, you know, a prizing process and, you know, potentially having the, the benefit of winning a, an annual, one of the annual Flourish prizes. And, you know, for students that have their stories published online, it's also great for them. They can put it on their LinkedIn page. I've had students talk about how they've used it as a writing sample when, um, when needing a writing sample for jobs or for, um, you know, other school applications. So there are a lot of benefits to, to the program and to being involved in the program. Um, and finally, just sharing this quote, um, this is one from students from Loyola Marymount University. You're gonna hear from, uh, from Jeff Thies, I think right after me. Um, but this is, we collect student uh, experiences from all of our students that go through and do the assignment and use the program. And so it's always nice to hear directly from them. And so this is just one that I pulled out that we really liked um, that we use sometimes and share on social media, but it's nice to hear directly from the students and to see the impact that doing this assignment has, has on them. And finally, um, there's my contact information. So I'm always available uh, for anybody that's ever interested or has questions. I'm happy to meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, talk about how we can fit this into your class and the benefits and how that might work. Um, but please reach out for, for anything. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Megan. Um, we're going to move right along here. Um, if you have questions, if you could put them in the chat to me, and then I'll make sure either if we integrate it into the end or if we run out of time, then uh, I'll make sure that whoever needs to answer the question will get back to you later today. All right. Jeff Thies from Loyola Marymount. Hi, good morning or afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be with you and have this opportunity to talk about our relationship with Prime and uh, also uh, the International Business Ethics and Sustainability Case Competition. Also like to thank uh, the introduction from Megan. Uh, we're big fans and boosters of Aim to Flourish and some of the ways that she shared and I'll share another example in just a second. But let me share the screen and uh, share a couple of images with you. And I've been invited, like I said, to speak about our international business ethics and sustainability case competition, but really do that in the context of our relationship with Prime. Uh, the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University became a signatory to Prime in 2018. And this is the cover of our inaugural SIP report, which we recently submitted. Um, we're on a bluff overlooking beautiful vistas 
Uh, but really one of the things that Prime does is helps us understand and frame really what it is that we see. Um, just below our bluff is uh, the technology center of um, Silicon Beach, the Los Angeles vibrant technology sector. If you stand on the bluff and look right, you see the Hollywood Hills. If you look left, you see the ports of Long Beach, Los Angeles, the uh, Marina del Rey Center. You see the vibrant import export sector uh, anchoring really the fifth largest economy on earth, which is the economy of California and really vistas that oversee profound um, challenges of inequality of income, of opportunity, tremendous density of population. Uh, you see this intersection of East and West and North and South, you see really both the opportunities and the profound needs of the world that we know are expressed in the sustainable development goals. Um, in 2018, with a new Dean, Dean Dale Smith, um, we began a process of analyzing for the College of Business Administration, our mission, our values, and what, how we would understand what our responsibility is as a College of Business Administration. That led to the articulation of a new mission statement for the CBA. That we understand our role to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the global economy. And it became uh, really our understanding that Prime would become a critical tool which would enable us to operationalize our mission. Uh, you can go to our website and you can see our values and you will see that we stipulate and state that as a signatory of Prime, we understand as one of our key values, our responsibility to advance the sustainable development goals in business education and in business practice. So one of the things that we did is we took our 26 year international business ethics case competition and we directed it to the sustainable development goals. And uh, this is held each April, so we're getting ready for it next month, but really excited to be able to share this with each of you. Um, and basically what we do is we invite student teams to work with the moral imperatives of sustainable development. Um, you'll see a link here. If you just simply Google LMU IBES or LMU IBESCC, you'll be taken directly to the details of this case competition. And basically what it does is um, it enables students to engage really in applying ethical reasoning business practices and the sustainable development goals. Um, unlike many case competitions where there is one project or one case that all teams work and then are judged against one another on the working of that one case, this one is structured differently. Student teams select their own cases. They choose their topics. So if we have 25 teams, we have 25 topics. That means we get to see a wide breadth of engagement around all sorts of issues related to the sustainable development goals. What they do is they identify a business ethics problem, and then they have to propose a business solution which resolves the problem. And that has to positively advance one of the sustainable development goals. That's how we link those. So then what they do is they explain and show how their solution is workable legally, financially, and ethically. Student teams present this before panels of senior ethics, sustainability, and operations executives, which gives them the opportunity and the experience of voicing values and really practicing and learning how to be persuasive before an executive audience. So one of the things that we like to say about this ethics, it is an ethics, case competition, a business ethics case competition, but we're really not asking students to talk about Kantian imperatives. We're really asking students to use persuasive business language with persuasive, with business executives making the ethics case for the sustainable development goal. And really what that does is it strengthens both their ethical reasoning, but then how that's applied, like I say, to the moral imperative of sustainable and development. And as I said before, if you just Google LMU IBESC, you can see the details of this. 
You can see videos of all previous presentations and you can see the framework for the case competition. Uh, we are an international case competition. Uh, we have teams from four continents. We have graduate teams, undergraduate teams, and teams uh, from throughout the United States. Um, and just to give one example, um, and this is just a snapshot from some of the uh, cases from a couple of years ago. Gender pay gap, could banking sector lead the way? That's from a team from Kuwait, uh, revolutionizing ethical coffee practices at Starbucks, no foul play, cleaning up manure at Tyson Foods, Mars Incorporated in India, building a sustainable route to market, outside the box, Amazon on packaging dilemmas, et cetera. So what I wanna share is you really have this opportunity for a breadth of topics. And one of the things that we really like about that in the case competition is that it really energizes student interest. So when they'll ask us, you know, what case should we select? What are you interested in? And that way it really reinforces their learning and their engagement with learning. Um, and then um, I, I, much like um, Megan, if you have questions, please email me at jeffreythies at lmu.edu or ibes at lmu.edu. Um, and maybe if I can just share one other thing quickly, one of the things that we're also piloting this year is something we're calling the Promotion of Justice Challenge, where we're um, focusing, creating student teams to focus on storytelling about business practices that advance SDG 5, 10, and 11, specifically around justice. And we're using Aim to Flourish as our preliminary round. And then, thank you, Megan. As a matter of fact, she was a speaker at a recent event that we had for that challenge. And then uh, we are then taking finalists and we are pairing them with mentors in the media arts and they will produce uh, you know, professionally uh, produced videos so that we can showcase those business practices in the fall. So great opportunities for collaboration here. So I love partnership on the goals. Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you, Jeff. And if you could put your uh, email address also just in the chat. So feel free to reach out to Jeff. All right, now we're moving on to David Steingard at the Hub School of Business at St. Joseph's University to talk about the SDG dashboard tool that they have created. David? Can everybody hear me and see my screen? Yes, thank yep. you. Oh, great, because I've had some issues lately. Well, following uh, Megan and Jeff, uh, Megan and I have been working very closely for the last six months, which I will, I will show you our debut. Uh, and Jeff being a fellow Jesuit school, we're all in the family. Uh, today, I just want to give you an update on what's been happening with the SDG dashboard. I'll provide a quick review and then some specific projects that have emerged. And then, uh, and Metti, this section is just for you, uh, really taking the dashboard and using it as a, as a vehicle to promote Prime because there's a lot of synergy going on around SDG integration and impact in business schools. So we recall that the um, SDG dashboard is basically a tool that we can use to measure, report, share what we're doing with our specific practices in teaching research and other areas related to our prime principles for uh, global impact. And I will actually give you a dashboard tour in a second. Uh, just some background on where the dashboard, the dashboard was born uh, in prime uh, and now uh, uh, gratefully is included in the official guide for the blueprint for SDGs. We had much participation for years from various schools around the world in prime and uh, the gratitude is extended uh, perpetual gratitude for this because it took a lot of iterations to make the tool effective, useful, uh, and, and helpful to advancing the goals. And you may see your school on there as well. Uh, and this is a slide we've been showing all over the place at AACSB. Uh, this is the combination of our leading schools in the dashboard uh, that have been with us uh, since the beginning. So let me just, if I can stop the share here and go back, uh, I will actually take you on a little tour. Oh, here, I can do this way, of dashboard. 
Ah, you see the dashboard? Good. So this dashboard represents all of the SDGs and all of our key impact areas. And these are pretty much prime principles in some way, shape, or form. And um, these currently, and this dashboard, we have dashboards for other university systems, but this dashboard is just for prime schools. Uh, and Liz, I did add you because you're building a prototype. Thank you. You are now in there in alphabetical order. Um, and the basic idea behind the dashboard is to see in the aggregate across all these schools where our activities are, right? So you can, you can see that there's a great deal of activity in teaching, which makes sense. Uh, decent work and economic growth makes a lot of sense as well. So life below water, don't have a lot of activity there. So as a strategic tool, Prime could use this and say, you know, maybe we should have an initiative on life below water because the earth is 70% water and 30% of the oceans are filled with plastic. That's an exaggeration, but that is uh, vital. So this gives us a diagnostic tool. So we can go from the grand strategic look at what is happening with uh, all of our activities across teaching, research. Yeah, these are definitions right out of, of, of uh, prime principles. But here's the beauty, I think, of it. And we we're talking, uh, Jeff, your first case there was about gender. So we can start to drill down. And there's many different search tools within the dashboard uh, that we can use to find specifics. So we can actually do all of the searching by countries. Um, but I want to take you deeper here. So research. So now we're just looking at research. Oops, I got the wrong box. Um, Research on gender should come up to 26. Yeah, there we go. So we see research on gender, and then we see all of the different entries that occur. And look at this, Case Western, Megan. These are actually two of my former professors who are still there and doing some amazing work in gender equality. Um, and later on, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing with the research end here. But the beauty is you can click on any one of these links and you can get the live data. And I just wanna call attention here. Here's a journal that many of us may not have heard of, Community Work and Family, that is publishing uh, our prime faculty on SDGs. And that's a really important uh, point to just keep note of. So, as I said, the prime principles underlie the dashboard. And one of the big innovations, and this is happening right now, we're gonna see this in FHGR in Switzerland. Uh, they've been one of our, our stalwart dashboarders since the beginning, and they are going to be integrating their dashboard into their SIP and there is Jörg. So basically what will happen is there will be an image in the SIP and then you'll click it and it will live link to a custom dashboard that will be on websites of different schools. So this is the FHGR website. You'd click there, you'd get the dashboard. We already have started embedding uh, the dashboard in other, this is HPI out of Germany. Uh, and this is a big deal because now each school can own and publish their own dashboard and we'll update it for you. Uh, we have another project going on with the, um, Prime Chapter India, and the goal is to get half of their 50 prime schools up and running on the dashboard so they can have a regional dashboard to do projects, collaborate, and, and share. That's the whole point. And we're hoping that we're able to present that at the Prime Global Forum with the 25 dashboards. Uh, Liz asked me to talk specifically about some of the, watching my time here, uh, some of the specific questions that have come up over the years about usability, privacy, data security, proprietary. And, and let me just make a blanket statement. Every entry in the dashboard is linked to a publicly available website. There is no proprietary, there's no secret data locker. Uh, there's anybody can download anything they want from it. It is completely open and, and transparent. Uh, it does not cost anything. It, you can choose to be in it or out of it at will. We have no control over that. We work with you closely. 
We have a student team, which now I'm doubling my student team, and they've been great. And we're interested in working with other uh, schools that have teams as well. Uh, AACSB, the recent AACSB Dean's Conference, my deans presented, uh, that's not my dean, although Dean D'Angelo was the former CEO and president, uh, SDGs are creeping in to AACSB. And AACSB schools, Jesuit schools, prime schools, they're all in the same universe. So we have gotten a, a indication, which you'll see in a minute, that our dashboard, and if you're an AACSB school and you do a dashboard, you're already done with standard nine. Standard nine, look, the top of the list of the new standard for societal impact for AACSB is actually SDGs. And then look at the other ones, human rights, community outcomes. These are all the kinds of things Prime's already working on. We had a, a, a beautiful tweet uh, endorsement from the chief accreditation officer says, go for it. You have standard nine, do a dashboard, you're done. I'm also really happy at the upcoming ICAM. Uh, I've been working closely with Evgeny and Nico, uh, and we are presenting the dashboard, Prime, and SDG integration and impact at our school. So that's coming up soon as well. Uh, we also just received $200,000 from the Johnson & Johnson Foundation and another $9,000 from the Global Community of Jesuit Business Schools, which is 100 plus. Uh, and Jeff, you're in that as well. Of course, we're all in the same family and we are commissioned to build 25 dashboards for the Jesuit Global Business School community. I'm doing all right. Uh, and this is a big deal. This just came out. I'll put the actual link in the chat. Um, out of that, remember I talked about the journal that we found uh, that was published by one of my professors, right? And that journal is not an FT50 journal. But you know what? We did analysis with AI and machine learning and natural language processing, and we discovered, to nobody's surprise, that the FT50 are not really geared toward impact or advancing the SDGs or any of the kind of shibboleths of what it is we are trying to advance in the transformation of management education. So we now an official partnership and rolled this out at AACSB by looking at journals from a point of impact as opposed to a point of standard metrics of citations, editorial boards, percentage of uh, admissions accept accepted for publication. And this is gonna be huge for Prime because it's gonna get journals that we publish in going to get them on the map. So we will be rolling out in Cabell's. Cabell's has 3,000 business journals. We're going to rate the top 250 and have those available. And one of the things I'm proposing, I'm talking to uh, Kent on Friday about seeing in our research aspect of Prime, which journals we have that we would want rated and to basically uh, be proud to show that these journals are where our faculty and prime publish and they make a difference. Um, well, I got through that pretty uh, quickly blazing. Uh, so because we're getting a large volume of, of requests, uh, this is the, our now our sort of uh, general email to send requests for dashboards. And, and this is very supervised email. So if you, if you do want to get through, uh, to me, this would be a great way um, to do it. And I am one minute ahead of schedule. Fabulous. Liz. Great job. And I will, uh, I'll second that David's team is very easy to work with. Uh, we've been working with one of the students to put all of our information on the dashboard. And um, these are great projects and um, and, and also just great news in terms of AACSB and Cabell's and he referred to Kent Williams, who's going to uh, be the point person in North America on research initiatives. Um, and so he and David are, are meeting on Friday to, uh, to begin just to, to help us get that up and running. All right, we'll now move to Gina Wurtenberg from the Rutgers School of Business. Gina? Yes, can you all see my screen? No. Okay. I thought I shared the screen. Share screen. Can you see it now? No, huh? 
No, Gina, we can't see it yet. If you just share screen, the green button at the bottom, and then you have to actually click on the screen that you want to share and then press share again. Sorry about that. No worries. Can you see it now? Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so I want to go to full screen. Slideshow. Full screen. Now I'm trying to go to full screen. Now you can see it. Everybody can see the screen. Yes. Yes. Yes, Great. we can. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I'm not that good technologically. So I'm very excited to have the opportunity to share with you today um, some highlights from our incredible four day conference. Um, and uh, which some of you actually attended and even presented at. It would be impossible for me to truly give it justice in 15 minutes, but I'll give you some highlights and let you know how to access the full set of presentations and recordings, and you can participate at your convenience in uh, what is of the greatest interest to you. To set some context, and I actually borrowed this slide from uh, several of my colleagues, uh, Bill Russell and Linda Kelly, who actually were one of the first presenters at the conference. Normal will never be the same. Everything has changed. Local depends on global and global depends on local. And here in this presentation, we focused on systems thinking, which is the process of understanding how everything is connected and also on mental models. I absolutely love this quote from one of our inspirations who was ahead of her time, Danella Meadows, that the sustainability revolution, which we're all engaged in, will be organic. It's gonna arise from like all of us, from the visions, the insights, the experiments and the actions of billions of people. The burden of making it happen is not on the shoulders of any one person or group. No one will get the credit, but everyone can contribute. So I'm so honored to be here sharing with you all. So my agenda for today, for the 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a little brief history of Prime Northeast, uh, tell you a little bit about our um, conference spot sponsors and call for proposals, talk about how we had to pivot after uh, COVID-19 hit two weeks before the conference that was planned for a year. Give you a few uh, conference highlights relative to what were the themes, the keynotes, uh, how we focused on three things, curricula and teaching, research, service and extracurricular. And I'm gonna hopefully have time to share with you a few of the implications and keys to success as well as the challenges. A little bit of history and background. Uh, the inaugural conference, uh, which was back in 20, 2009, uh, focused on sustainable business practices. And what we've tried to do is to set a baseline of corporate coming from the industry's perspective on what were their corporate priorities relative to sustainability. The second conference, we decided to focus on learning and adaptation. The third conference, we focused on innovation. And then, um, and there we had some pioneering leaders such as Jeffrey Hollander, uh, Susan Jackson, to um, focus on systemic change and transformation. We skipped a number of years. And then in 2018, after the Sustainable Development Goals, we focused on pedagogy, practice, and policy. And here we started to have a multi-stakeholder approach um, to address the sustainable development goals with a sense of urgency. These were the sponsors for the conference. And I was uh, bold enough at the uh, 2018 conference to say I wanted to uh, host it at Rutgers uh, the following year, uh, which ended up being the 2020 conference. Uh, it was hosted by the Rutgers Business School as well as the Rutgers Institute for Corporate Social Innovation that I'm affiliated with. So off to the side. Okay. So the first thing that we did was we set up a uh, call for proposals and we shared it very uh, widely. We disseminated it through
Oh, yeah, Gina, it looks like you've muted yourself. Oh, I accidentally muted myself. Sorry. Uh, that was an accident. Did I, hopefully you can all, you didn't miss too much. Yeah, it was just about the last five seconds. Okay, great. I was just trying to move that off the screen. So we disseminated the uh, call for proposals very widely. Uh, one of the major ways we did that was through the Academy of Management, I'm a member of numerous of the divisions, and that really helped get a lot of interest. Uh, Prime was great in sharing it. Uh, the New Jersey Higher Education Partnership for Sustainability, as well as all of our personal networks. Um, the full call for proposals is available on the website. And um, I'm happy to say we had a really good mix of proposals on all of these different topics, embedding sustainability in the curricula and campus activities, facilitating sustainable mindsets through experiential learning, we had uh, some very deep dives into LCA and resource allocations. Uh, we had uh, presentations on policy um, from the New Jersey State uh, Clean Energy Group and uh, some broad reaching proposals on sustainable economies and societies. Okay. Now I'm trying to advance my slides and they're not advancing. Ah, there it is. So some of the, uh, what happened after that was that we needed to um, pivot uh, after COVID. So we did receive more than 40 proposals from all over the world. We set up a committee to establish the criteria and rate the proposals. And we ended up having five themes emerge, um, which you can see here. And while the conference was originally scheduled for face-to-face, -face, uh, we had to pivot when two weeks before the conference, uh, we had to postpone it due to COVID. So we went to a four day, all virtual and no charge event and we were thrilled to end up with over a thousand registrants from 61 countries and 34 states. We had 76 presenters from 50 universities and um, we continued to manifest our cherished core values of being inclusive, collaborative, multi and transdisciplinary and synergistic. We had altogether six fantastic keynotes uh, which you see here, uh, we had Stuart Hart talking about uh, reinventing business education and his MBA program uh, at University of Vermont. Uh, Andy Hoffman gave an amazing presentation. All of these are available on our website, which I'm gonna attempt to uh, navigate to now. Um, Meta gave a wonderful presentation, thank you Meta, on the impact-based university in the decade of action. And Daniel Dart uh, did, told the amazing story of his personal transformation from being homeless. The students really loved this one. And we closed the conference with our uh, presentation by our new president from Rutgers, Jonathan Holloway, on building a beloved community at Rutgers. So actually, I'm um, gonna go to the website in a minute. I wanted to uh, show you where to find all of these. So if I can attempt to share my screen again, can you see that everybody? Yes. Oh, wonderful. So this is the website and um, business.ruckers.edu slash Rixie slash prime. And that you can put that in the chat. And um, what I wanted to point out here is you need to scroll down and here you can see uh, the detailed schedule, a 43 page full conference brochure with abstracts of every session, the actual conference presentations, and we also coordinated and collaborated with the Meatless Monday uh, initiative. If you scroll down, you can see all of the recordings right here, and they're organized by the day and time. And below that, you can also see the Rixi YouTube channel. On our website, we also have a lot about Rutgers commitment uh, to the principles for responsible management education. Uh, we have uh, links to our SIP report and you can read all about that. I'm gonna switch back to the presentation. Okay. So, 
So for the presentation, um, I'm focusing now uh, briefly on just showing you the richness and the diversity of presentations in each of the major topics. So relative to curricula and teaching, uh, we had a presentation uh, from the SDG Academy with uh, Florencia Labrizzi and her colleagues. We had a wonderful presentation on NYU Stern's uh, full required first year intro course. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but as you can see, they came from many different universities. Bucknell, we had Eben Goodstein talking about uh, how to solve climate by 2030. Um, Eben Goodstein from Bard. Um, multiple uh, sessions from Brazil. Uh, we had one from Nigeria. And you're welcome to look at all of these uh, on our website both the presentations as well as the uh, recordings. In terms of research, we had a number of professors uh, presenting their research as well as students uh, working with them on uh, many different topics related to um, developing profitability through sustainability signaling. We had a deep dive into ESG governance relative to the retirement and mutual funds. Uh, we had a wonderful presentation on a whole new way of looking at preserving employment in the, age, in the aging society. Uh, one on um, the city as accelerator, focused on work, on innovative work going on in Newark. And then in terms of service and extracurricular, we had several panels. We had an executive panel and a careers panel wonderful session of, uh, from a student panel and a student dialogue session focused on um, manifesting the next generation of sustainability. They were incredibly inspiring. We also did some deep inner work at looking at ourselves an inner engineering approach. And um, there was an interesting session on gender equity, which for the first time that I've seen uh, included transgender. And as I mentioned earlier, we focused also on energy efficiency from the government perspective. So a couple of conclusions, and, and I think I'm, um, I'll uh, be able to wrap up here. First of all, what are the keys to success that we found? First of all, building a prime community that is voluntary. So we did all of this as a labor of love. We were an official chapter at that time. Um, we were self-organizing, we were organic, we were emergent. Every conference built on the next one. Uh, we focused on the bottom up and grassroots commitment, but also top down leadership and support. And we did have that from uh, our university president on down. Uh, we wanted to be inclusive of activism. So we had very powerful activist speakers as well as student participation in setting the agenda and running the conference. They were very uh, supportive. We very much uh, love the appreciative inquiry approach. Um, and so we took that uh, and actually used appreciative inquiry in our dialogue session. And finally, we very much relied on the regional and local champions to spearhead the conference design and execution, as well as reaching out to people from business government at all levels, local, national, and regional, as well as NGOs. And finally, uh, we still realize we have some challenges and opportunities. We want to increase the awareness of Prime and SDGs. It's amazing that so many people still haven't heard about it uh, by capturing people's hearts as well as their minds. We want to maximize our impact by connecting to student action on the ground. We want to accelerate and measure our impact and engage more students, both as participants as well as presenters. They have a lot to say and as real, really the pivotal stakeholders in preparing for their future roles as the decision makers and leaders for the future. And I think I'm right on time. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, I hope that you found that interesting. Yes, that was perfect. Um, and they're just, I think that this hour has been fantastic in terms of providing so many different resources that people can see now what do you particularly want to work on? And there are people to connect with and websites and other resources. Um, so I, I appreciate all four of you for taking the time to do this and to share all of your resources with everyone. I put my email address in the chat. 
If you're interested in any type of information about the North America chapter of Prime, or you would like to engage with any of the initiatives here, or are interested in more engagement with teaching or research, uh, please email me. We're in the middle of reconstructing the chapter and we have a lot of opportunities for uh, leadership and engagement. Uh, we'll have a website just for the chapter up this summer. And we've already begun planning a June 2022 chapter-wide meeting and conference, which will take place at George Mason University. And as Gina, I think, put beautifully, this whole sense of capturing you know, minds and hearts is really my experience at um, all of the chapter meetings that we've had in the past um, in Cleveland with Kent State and Case Western, uh, the University of Guelph, uh, Kennesaw State and Atlanta. They are always in energizing, informative, and inspiring. And thankfully, you know, the the assumption is that next June we'll be able to all, you know, meet and, and have sort of the in-person connection as well. So um, thank you for your participation. Please contact me if you have any questions and um, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Liz. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you, Liz. Thank you, everybody. Great to see everybody. Awesome. Take care. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.